Having introduced contact angle measurements, in this lecture we will apply this technique to measure the surface-free energy of solid surfaces. Surface-free energy values for solids are useful for estimating adhesion strength, the extent of spreading, work of immersion, and other phenomena involving surface and interfacial processes. Before we get started, we need to discuss the use of terminology briefly. We often hear the term surface and interface used interchangeably. Also used interchangeably are the terms surface or interfacial free energy, energy, and tension. This practice has become so common that it is important to be comfortable with these variations in the terminology. However, we should always have a clear understanding of what property is being discussed. Solid surface energy is a physical property of a solid, which is of great importance when the solid is brought into contact with other solids and liquids. The industrial importance is clear for applications involving coatings and adhesives, but its influence, though more subtle, is significant in a wide variety of fields including pulp and paper, printing, packaging, pharmaceuticals, aerospace, mining, microelectronics, and so on. In general, a high surface energy implies a greater reactivity and a tendency to attract other materials, including contaminants. The opposite is also true, which is why the term Teflon is sometimes applied to those for which scandal or dirt, metaphorically speaking, does not stick. As is outlined above, the surface tension of a liquid and the interfacial tension between two liquids can be determined via techniques such as a Wilhelmy plate denoy ring, corrected drop weight, and others. These techniques use the ability of liquids to flow and deform under stress to obtain the needed data. In the case of solid surfaces, this ability is absent, and values for surface energy must be obtained indirectly. A popular approach for doing this is through the use of contact angle measurements. From the Young's equation, the surface energy can be calculated from the surface tension of a liquid, its contact angle on the solid, and the solid-liquid interfacial energy. Both the surface tension of the liquid and its contact angle can be measured directly, but the solid-liquid interfacial energy cannot be measured directly. It can, however, be approximated. We will show how this is done in practice and how values can be used to estimate the surface energy of a solid by reviewing a few of the most common approaches. The approaches are categorized based on the number of contributions to the surface free energy being considered. That is, we often split the surface free energy into a number of contributions from different types of interactions that are lost. For example, London interactions versus hydrogen bonds. The greater the number of components, the more complex the equations, but they remain algebraic. Here we consider examples of one and two component estimates. So for the remainder of this chapter, we are looking at methods for estimating the surface energy of a solid. The surface tension of a liquid and the contact angle for that liquid on the solid can be measured directly. But according to Young's equation, this leaves two unknowns, the surface energy of the solid and the solid-liquid interfacial energy. In a previous lecture, an expression for estimating the interfacial energy was developed. This expression will be used throughout the rest of this chapter to develop methods for estimating solid surface energy. The first method we will discuss is the Zeisman method or analysis. This technique is often viewed as being outdated, but actually provides one of the more accurate estimates of surface energy for low energy surfaces. This is an experimental approach aimed at identifying the probe liquid with a surface tension that is equal to the surface free energy of the solid. According to our equation for interfacial energy, when this occurs, the solid liquid interfacial energy is equal to zero. Under these circumstances, the contact angle for the probe liquid on the solid surface is zero degrees. However, keep in mind that when a liquid completely wets a solid, even if a drop cannot be formed, we say that that liquid has a contact angle of zero degrees on that solid. In other words, complete wetting by a probe liquid does not mean that the surface energy of the solid is equal to the surface tension of the probe liquid. What we are looking for is the surface tension of a liquid that is just able to form a drop on the solid surface with a contact angle of zero. This is the critical surface energy, which is an estimate of the surface energy for the solid. Keep in mind, however, that it is likely that a liquid that is just able to wet a particular solid does not exist. It's hypothetical. 
The question then is how do we find this critical surface tension for a hypothetical liquid that is just able to form a drop on our solid surface with a contact angle of zero degrees? For this, Zeisman proposed an extrapolation approach. The cosine of the contact angle for a series of liquids is plotted against their surface tension. This is referred to as a Zeisman plot. The ordinate can conceivably range from negative one to one corresponding to contact angles of 180 degrees down to zero degrees, respectively. For liquids demonstrating complete wetting, the contact angle is assigned a value of zero degrees. This is according to convention, as we discussed. Shown here is the schematic construction for the Zeisman plot for polytetrafluoroethylene, or Teflon. The plot is developed using measured surface tensions for normal alkane liquids as well as their static contact angles on the Teflon surface. As mentioned, when the liquid completely wets the solid, the cosine of the contact angle is assumed to be equal to 1, which explains the shape of the curve. The surface tension corresponding to the intersection between the horizontal line at the cosine of the contact angle equal to 1 and the extrapolated linear fit for the remaining data, data for which the cosine of the contact angle is not equal to 1, is identified as the critical surface tension. This is an estimate of the surface energy for our solid. Another approach for fitting the data is to shift the ordinate by the critical surface tension so that the intercept is equal to 1. Thus, the goal is to find the shift that provides the best fit of the data for liquids that only partially wet the solid. Typically, the slope for this line is found to be between 0.03 and 0.04. The Zeisman analysis is considered a one-parameter approach. Given that it does not evaluate individual contributions to the surface free energy, it is often described as a less rigorous approach. However, published studies demonstrate that the approach can be quite sensitive to relatively minor changes in solid surface compositions. Of course, the accuracy of this method is strongly dependent on the accuracy to which the surface tension of the liquids is known and the quality of the static contact angle measurements. This approach is believed to work best for low energy surfaces for which purely London forces contribute to the surface energy, that is, low energy solids and alkane solvents. Let's next look at what are considered more sophisticated methods known as multi-component approaches. Hopefully you remember this expression, which tends to be quite useful in surface science. Let's apply it here to start developing a two-component expression for the interfacial free energy. We begin by dividing the interfacial energy into a pair of independent components. This includes contributions from weak, non-hydrogen bond van der Waals interactions, which we call dispersive and identify with a capital D, and strong hydrogen bond van der Waals contributions, which are said to be polar, identified here with a capital P. Let's put what we're doing into perspective. The interfacial free energy is the change in the free energy with the expansion of the interface. We can think of it as a single molecule for each of the contacting phases, leaving their bulk regions and meeting at the interface, similar to a process such as a chemical leaving a pure phase and moving into a solvent. When we examine those processes, we used a similar approach. We split up the free energy into contributions from assumed independent interactions. As independent contributors to free energy, the interfacial equation applies to the dispersive and polar free energies. We add these up to produce an expression widely used in surface energy measurements of polymeric materials. So now let's return to Young's equation. And remember, we noted the fact that we can measure contact angle, we can measure surface tension. Uh, we're after the surface energy of the solid, and we have a way to estimate the interfacial energy. And now we've taken that estimate for interfacial energy and we've broken it down into contributions from polar and dispersive type interactions. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to plug this expression into Young's equation for the interfacial energy. And when we do this, we can rearrange the equation to this form here. So let me next talk about how we can use this equation along with measurements of the contact angle for different organic probe liquids on the surface of that solid to estimate its surface energy. Now this last equation can be rearranged the following slope-intercept form. 
using known or determined polar and dispersive components for the probe liquids and the measured contact angles made using these probe liquids on the surface of the solid, the so-called owens went plot can be constructed. For liquids, surface tension measurements only provide the total surface tension, not the polar and dispersive components. These values must be obtained from the literature or they must be measured. As can be seen from the slide, the slope and intercept provide the polar and dispersive components of the surface free energy of the solid, respectively. The construction of the owen went plot is reportedly an effective approach when characterizing low energy surfaces. When examining higher energy surfaces, a more common approach is to use only two pure probe liquids, one that possesses only a dispersive component and another possessing significant contributions from both polar and dispersive components. When this is done, it is often referred to as the Folks approach. The liquids commonly used are diiodomethane and water. It can be seen from the table shown on the slide. Diiodomethane possesses only a dispersive component, while water possesses both. The contact angle measurements for both diiodomethane and water provide the data necessary to estimate these components for the solid being characterized. It should be emphasized that a variety of other theories exist, which based on contact angle measurements allows for the estimate of surface free energy. These differ in how they deal with the asymmetric interaction energies and some further break down the contributions to the polar component of the interaction energy. In practice, the Folks approach tends to find greater use especially when it comes to polymeric materials. The table shown here lists surface tension values which were presented previously, uh, but it also splits the surface tension into contributions from lost dispersive interactions and lost polar interactions. One thing to note here is you look at some of these compounds such as diethyl ether and uh, diiodomethane. Both of those compounds are polar compounds, but they have zero contribution to the polar component of the surface energy or surface tension. Uh, keep in mind the reason this is the case is that the way we've defined polar and dispersive interactions, we've defined polar interactions here as those involving hydrogen bonding, while dispersive components encompasses all other types of van der Waals interactions. This table shows estimates of surface energy values for a handful of polymers. These surface energy values were estimated from contact angle measurements made with probe organic liquids on the surfaces of the polymers, and then the data was interpreted either using the Owens-Went approach or the Owens-Went plot or the Folks approach. And you can see in the table here, I've listed the total surface energy for these polymeric materials, and I've also split that between dispersive and polar contributions. This slide reviews an example of how we can estimate the surface energy of a polymeric material using contact angle measurements. In this case, we're looking at the Folks approach. The example asks if the contact angle for water and diiodomethane on a solid surface are 110 degrees and 70 degrees respectively, estimate its surface energy polar and dispersive components as well as the total surface energy. So we have a sample of this polymeric material and we went into the laboratory and we measured the contact angles for both water and diiodomethane on the surface of this material. And in previous slides, we discussed how to make these measurements. Now using our equation, let's first look at diiodomethane, which as we remember has a polar component equal to zero. So if we look at the equation, that tells us that the first term on the right-hand side is zero. And if we look at the left-hand side, we need the contact angle measurement, we need the surface tension or surface energy of the diiodomethane as well as its dispersive component. And we have all these things, and so we can just go ahead and calculate the dispersive component of the surface energy for this polymeric material. So that first step was very straightforward, and we got a value of 22.87 millijoules per meter squared. So let's move on now. So we started out with the solvent, which has a polar component equal to zero, and now we're going to use the solvent or the organic probe liquid that 
that has both a polar component and a dispersive component, which in this case is water, which had a contact angle of 110 degrees. So in our equation, we can plug in the dispersive component for the surface energy, which was just determined. And with this contact angle measurement, we have everything else we need. We have the contact angle, we have the surface tension or surface energy of the water, we have its dispersive component as well as its polar component. And the only thing that we're missing in this equation is the one unknown, which is the polar component of the surface energy for the polymeric material, and we solve for that. Now, the example also asks you to estimate the total surface energy, which we know is simply the sum of the polar component and the dispersive component. Often in surface science textbooks, concept diagrams are used to demonstrate processes that involve changes in the size and or nature of system surfaces and interfaces. We will refer to such processes as surface processes. Here, the analysis of three important surface processes, adhesion, spreading, and immersion, are reviewed. It is important to remember that surface and interfacial energies are equilibrium state variables, and the processes described fall under the realm of thermodynamics. Thus, calculations of the change in energy involved can be accomplished by considering only the initial and final states. This simplifies our analysis. The disadvantage is that the values calculated are for reversible processes, which rarely occur in practice. Assuming constant temperature and pressure, the calculated change in Gibbs free energy indicates whether the process is spontaneous and nature is facilitating it, or non-spontaneous, in which case the calculated change in energy represents the minimum work necessary to complete the process. A good starting point to demonstrate this is the thermodynamic work of adhesion. This is the reversible work per unit area required to separate two dissimilar surfaces. The process involves the separation of an interface to produce two surfaces. Under constant temperature and pressure conditions, the change in the Gibbs free energy is obtained by summing up the products of the surface energies multiplied by the changes in the surface areas resulting from the process. This is the approach we will use for all three surface processes described here at the end of the chapter. It can be seen that A is the area of separation. By multiplying both sides by the inverse of this area, that is 1 over A, we obtain the thermodynamic work of adhesion, indicated here with a capital W and a subscript capital A. The final term on the right-hand side of this equation can be estimated using the equation developed for approximating interfacial energy, which we discussed extensively. Also, keep in mind that this process could be carried out in a liquid rather than in air or in a vapor. Under these circumstances, the equation for estimating the interfacial energy must be used to approximate all of the interfacial energy terms. Furthermore, it is possible to split the surface energies into polar and dispersive components. This is thought to provide more accurate estimates of the thermodynamic work of adhesion. This slide reviews an example where we demonstrate the calculation of the thermodynamic work of adhesion in an aqueous environment. The example states that a solid material with a surface energy of 26 millijoules per meter squared is coated with polyethylene, which has a surface energy of 33 millijoules per meter squared. And you are asked to calculate the thermodynamic work of adhesion for the separation of the polyethylene coating from the solid in water. So in other words, we have the solid material, we know its surface energy, it's coated with polyethylene, it's in an aqueous environment, and the polyethylene coating comes off the surface of that solid. And the question is, is what is the work necessary per unit area to move this coating off the surface? Well, here's the equation we developed. The only difference now is that all three terms are interfacial terms. On the right-hand side of the equation, the first term is the interfacial energy between the solid and the water, and the second term is the interfacial energy between the polyethylene and water. That, that accounts for the final state of the system. The initial state is the interface between the solid and the polyethylene coating. So to solve this problem, we simply have to plug in for these interfacial terms the equation we developed for estimating interfacial energy, which I've done here. Reduce it. And then we can go ahead and plug in all these values. We're using uh, the values that were listed when we stated the example. 
and the 26 millijoules per meter squared for the solid, the 33 millijoules per meter squared for the polyethylene, and we will use 73 millijoules per meter squared for water. And we do this, we get a value of 19 millijoules per meter squared. This example repeats the calculations from the previous example. The difference is that we're using the two-component approximation for interfacial energy here. So the example is stated uh, about the same way as we stated it before. A solid material is coated with polyethylene. The difference here is that I'm providing both the dispersive and polar components for the solid and for the polyethylene coating. And we are asked to calculate the thermodynamic work of adhesion for the separation of the polyethylene coating from the solid in water. And we're asked to use the two-component approximation for interfacial energy. So here's the equation for the thermodynamic work of adhesion, keeping in mind that uh, the separation process is being carried out in water. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna substitute in our approximation for interfacial energy for each one of these terms, but in this case, we're going to use the two-component approximation. We've split the surface energy into contributions from dispersive interactions and polar interactions. Now this equation can be reduced a little bit, and after we plug in all the numbers I provided here, here's the value I get for the estimate of the thermodynamic work of adhesion, which is significantly higher than what we obtained previously. Now, most people believe that this two-component approximation is going to give us a better estimate of the work of adhesion. This slide provides one last example related to the thermodynamic work of adhesion. Using the equation for the thermodynamic work of adhesion and Young's equation, which are provided below here, develop an expression for the work of adhesion to remove a liquid drop from a solid surface in terms of the surface tension for the liquid and the contact angle for the liquid on the solid. So we have a liquid drop sitting on a solid surface with a contact angle, theta, which according to Young's equation is determined by a force balance of the three-phase line between these different surface tension components. And we're asked to estimate the amount of reversible work necessary to simply lift this drop off the surface of the solid. Now this process assumes that the drop does not change shape as we lift it up. So it's a pretty unrealistic process. But the expression we develop is still useful because it gives us information on how strongly this liquid is interacting with the solid surface. And to develop this equation is just a couple steps here. Start out with Young's equation. And then for the numerator of Young's equation on the right-hand side here, we're gonna substitute in a rearranged form of the thermodynamic work of adhesion. Then we'll go ahead and isolate the work of adhesion, and this is the young dupree equation. Now looking at this equation, what it tells us is something we discussed previously. We had said that when we put a liquid down on a surface, the lower the contact angle, the stronger the interaction between that liquid and the solid. This is consistent with the equation. Something else it shows us is that if that contact angle is 180 degrees, the adhesion between the liquid and the solid is zero. Now, something else to keep in mind here is one of the criticisms for Young's equation is that it is for mechanical equilibrium. And you see in this derivation, we're substituting in this equation for mechanical equilibrium into a thermodynamic expression, which is an equilibrium science. So we're mixing mechanical equilibrium with thermodynamic equilibrium, which was one of the main criticisms of Young's equation and its use in the development of equations such as the Young-Dupree equation. Another surface process of interest is that of spreading, which is quantified with a spreading coefficient. Here, the change of free energy associated with the spreading of a liquid over a solid is estimated. As before, under constant temperature and pressure conditions, the Gibbs free energy is obtained by summing the product of the surface energies multiplied by the change in the surface areas resulting from the process. It can be seen that A is the area of wetting. By multiplying this equation by negative one on both sides and by the inverse of the area, one over A, we obtain the spreading 
coefficient, which we've indicated here with a lowercase s subscript ls. For this process to be spontaneous, the spreading coefficient must be positive. The middle term on the right-hand side of the equation involves an interfacial energy, which we estimate with the equation that we had developed earlier. We usually only calculate this process in air or in vapor, but variations can be accounted for with the simple adjustments to the equation. One last example of a surface process is the thermodynamic work of immersion. This is the reversible work per unit area required to completely wet the surface area of a particle or of a set of particles. Again, under constant temperature and pressure conditions, the change in the Gibbs free energy is obtained by summing the products of the surface energies multiplied by the change in surface areas resulting from the process. The surface area, which we're indicating again with a capital A here, is the surface area of the particle or particles. By multiplying the developed equation by the inverse of this area, that is 1 over A, we obtain the thermodynamic work of immersion, which we've indicated here with an uppercase W subscript uppercase I. The transfer can occur from air or vapor, which requires that the interfacial approximation be used for one of the terms. It can also occur from a liquid, which requires that both terms be approximated with the interfacial energy equation previously developed. It is also possible to use the two-component approximation, which is thought to give a better estimation of this value. By itself, the work of immersion is not all that interesting. But when combined with other measured thermodynamic quantities, specifically the heat of immersion, the relative contributions from internal energy changes and entropy can be assessed. The heat of immersion can be measured via calimetry. However, given the small amount of heat that's released, this usually requires that a phase be ground into a fine powder. Furthermore, the surface area of this powder must be known to extract useful information. This slide reviews an example where we estimate the thermodynamic work of immersion for the transfer of a small polymer particle between two immiscible organic liquids. The example states that a very small particle of of polypropylene is suspended in a beaker containing two immiscible phases shown in the schematic below where the top layer is composed of hexane and the bottom layer is composed of water. The first part of this example asks us to derive a formula for the thermodynamic work of immersion for the transfer process shown in terms of the polar and dispersive components for the solid and liquid phases. So this is very straightforward. We start out with the equation which was just introduced, where the first term is the interfacial energy between the polypropylene particle and water, that's the final state, minus the initial state, which is the interfacial energy between the polypropylene and the hexane. So all we need to do here is to substitute in for both of these terms our equation for estimating interfacial energy, but here we're going to use the two-component approximation. And when we do this, we end up with this result here, which is a little bit complex because it contains uh, quite a few terms. Now in the next slide, we're actually going to use this to make a calculation. For the second part of this example, we're actually going to estimate the thermodynamic heat of immersion for moving that polypropylene particle from hexane to water. Now the way the problem is stated here is, first of all, we're asked to estimate the surface energy components of polypropylene given that the contact angles for water and diiodomethane are 106 and 64 degrees respectfully. So this is a way to draw on our knowledge of the Fuchs approach to estimate the surface energy components for a polymer particle. Then we're going to go ahead and use this result to estimate the thermodynamic work of immersion for transferring this polypropylene particle between hexane and water. And finally, we're asked to comment on whether we believe this process is spontaneous. Now, the first part of this problem is something we've seen before. Here we have a contact angle for diiodomethane of 64 degrees on the surface of this polypropylene particle. And using the equation that we had developed earlier, we remember that we can go ahead and right away estimate the dispersive component for 
the polymer, simply using that measured contact angle and the surface tension of the diode of methane and its dispersive component, which of course there is no polar component, so that's equal to its surface energy. So right away we have the dispersive component for the polypropylene. Now, we can also go ahead and estimate the polar component using the results for the contact angle of water on the polypropylene. You probably didn't have to go through this calculation because if you had drawn out the structure of polypropylene, you would see that it is not able to participate and hydrogen bonding, so right away you could have come to the conclusion that the polar component for the polypropylene was equal to zero. But if you went through the calculation, at least you got some practice applying the Folks approach. So now we have the surface energy components for the polypropylene, and we've provided it for hexane, and previously we provided it for water. And this is the equation we derived on the previous slide for estimating the thermodynamic work of immersion. It's just a matter of plugging all of our values in, and I come up with the thermodynamic work of immersion of 46 millijoules per meter squared, which is greater than zero. It's a positive quantity, which indicates that this transfer process of this polypropylene particle between hexane and water is not a spontaneous process. Hopefully, if you consider the materials involved, you would have come to that conclusion without actually having to make these calculations. With the completion of this lecture, we finish up our chapter on surface energy, surface tension, contact angle, and wetting. One of this chapter's objectives was to provide practical knowledge on these topics, including the experimental measurement of quantities such as surface tension and contact angle, and the introduction of methods for estimating the surface energy of solids. We also reviewed approaches for predicting the strength of adhesive bonds, the spreading of liquids on solid surfaces, and the liquid immersion of powders. An additional aim here was to provide a more fundamental understanding of what gives rise to surface phenomenon. A liquid surface's tendency to spontaneously contract is just one example of how molecular species can alleviate the free energy, resulting from the loss of stabilizing interactions. The instability manifests itself in various ways at the molecular scale, including translations, reorientations, and enhanced reactivities.